DJ Troy, composer of Five Corner Square. I'd love to ask you some questions about that piece. First of all, squares don't have five corners. That's right. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a unique play on words. I, I was toying with different, uh, just sort of nonsensical phrases. You know, four corner triangle, five corner square. The five corner square just had a little bit better ring to me. But honestly, it started because it's a mallet trio mm -hmm. uh, for bass marimba, uh, diamond marimba and the bamboo marimba, the boo, right? So here's this triangle, this unique triangle, and when we set up on stage, it's often in this very unique triangle of sort of area. But honestly, five corner square just had a little bit better jingle to it. So, so there's nothing about the, a five cornered square in the form of the piece. It's Not necessarily. It's just a title. It's just a title. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just a little play on words. Well, what about the piece? It's put together a very, I mean, the, the craft of composition is very clear. You've got different themes in it. It's, I mean, when people think about parts instruments, they, if, I don't know what they think. <laughs> this is going to be wild and crazy and random. This couldn't be anything less. This is a, a highly structured, the counterpoint, everybody's talking to each other, there's different themes moving together. How did you know what to do when? Do you play all those instruments? Well, I play the bass marimba, and I have since since we started, 2003, 2004, right. when you first recruited. And what's interesting, too, is you sort of recruited myself, Nick, and Aaron all at the same time. <laughs> all right. So this trio that I composed for, we came to Parch all at the exact same time. Um, so my time has been spent primarily behind bass marimba, and that's where I started composing this piece. So uh, I have a practice frame. For those of you who don't know, the bass marimba is the size of my car. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's, it's huge. huge. <laughs> and it's, you know, five and a half feet tall, maybe six feet tall or so. So it's, it's very high. It's not commensurate to setting that up in your living room or your practice room. Uh, it's a jam on it, right? So I built a practice frame that actually I could transport into other places. So just the keys went on it, not the resonance. Exactly right. Yeah. So, okay. um, but those keys actually have a good deal of resonance just on their own. So mm. you still have a very clear idea of pitch and a, a pretty clear idea of timbre. Although I'm so familiar with the instrument and the different mallets that I use on it, I'm keeping those different timbral choices in mind, and I'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I did was set up this practice frame with the keys on it and just spend a couple days improvising. And any time I had uh, a lick or a riff or a motif that just seemed to speak to me aesthetically, I recorded it even if it was a five or 10 second little snippet. Let's mm. just hear that. And then of course you play those things back just as you would with a dictaphone, you know, listening back to your own. You're making sketches. Yeah, exactly. And some of these sketches were, you know, four sixteenth notes long, just little <laughs> fragments. <laughs> like, I like this. And then where, what would happen if I took that riff and started to transpose it into different places on the instrument? So here's an interesting thing with the bass marimba I discovered is that, um, it seems to be set up in three different sections. There's the low, there's 11 keys total, mm -hmm. the low four, the middle three, and then the upper four. They, they seem to have different roles that they play. The lowest four bars, of course, are very fundamental um, bass tones, right? Parches one one, of course, is G, and that is the one, two, three, fourth key up from the bottom, right? So here's your home tone of G, and then the pitches beneath that are very stable consonant intervals beneath that one, one. The next middle row seems to outline um, that main arpeggio coming off of that G one, one, and it's sort of abstracted. And then the upper four keys are very tight chromatically, so they seem to be melodic voices, mm. okay? And you can really see this play out with his writing in Castor and Pollux, mm. because he has two people playing on the instrument, the upper four, uh, or the, I should say the upper bass marimba player. That's right, and that's usually Nick up there and you're right. down on the bottom. Exactly. Right? So he's doing a lot of that melodic motion up there, where I, as I'm playing very fundamental harmonic stability on the mm. low end of the instrument. So I kind of knew this going in and spent my time improvising and exploring through that came up with the riffs that I liked, okay, saved those. And then I borrowed the diamond marimba from Aaron Barnes and brought it over to the house and I set those two up side by side and did the exact same thing, started improvising and just improvised and improvised for days, right? Recorded anything that I thought sounded good. 
Um, but then I started to, to map out what are the relationships between the instruments. And this is where Genesis of a Music is so important because he has all these things mapped out for you. Let's remind folks that Genesis of a Music is the one book that Parch wrote, you know, and it's, it's the Bible, pun intended. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was absolutely essential reading for me to really take the next level into understanding his mm. music. You know, I can understand quite a bit as a player. My instinct for harmony and melody kicks in. Um, spending time with his repertoire, you get to know some of his tendencies, and he has many. You know, and I get the feeling that he spent a lot of time doing what I did, which is improvising behind the instruments, because a lot of his writing is purely idiomatic mm. for the instrument. It lays so nicely from the hands uh, to the instrument. So it, the instruments were basically telling him what to play. Very so, much so. And then so. he could sculpt it from there, and that was your process. Yeah. Did Same you thing. ever have to be an octopus and because you had both instruments in the room? Or did you record that bass thing, put it on speakers, and then play along with it? What I did, actually, is I recruited a student of mine <laughs> who's currently a graduate student <laughs> up at CalArts. Uh, a gentleman, Lon Hayes is his name. And uh, Lon came over for his lesson, and I said, hey, I, th I need your help for some things here. <laughs> yeah. I need you to play th these riffs on bass marimba, and then I'm going to play this on diamond marimba. And so just by hearing that, knowing that my instinct, my ear was taking me in the right way. But then I mapped out, and specifically on the diamond marimba, finding where um, scalar and arpeggiated material lies mm. on that instrument became key and understanding. So here's where my G home tone is on bass marimba. Well, I got that. Where is that arpeggio going to lie? on the diamond marimba. And then how can I use the microtonal material to alter that melodic sensibility? Because your piece is tonal. There's yeah. a center to it. And you leave and you come back, just like those old guys. 100%. Right? 100%. And that yet, was, with a twist, because yeah. the melodies are da, 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 they're, they're Parchian. You know, I've always thought this about Parch's 43-tone scale. Mm -hmm. It's not so different from any other diatonic scale that we would encounter. And Parch didn't he wrote often for the 43-tone scale as a chromatic entity. Yes. Okay. We're yes. hearing squirrels run across the top here, so. <laughs> They're welcome. <laughs> um, he, he did often write um, purely chromatic sketches, and that's some of the, the wonderment of his music that I think leaves people mystified. But very often you can hear him taking a very deliberate diatonic approach to things. So he's skipping over tones in the 43 tones. Of course, yeah. And yeah. you start to hear a G major scale emerge with that twist that you're talking yeah, about because yeah. some of those intervals grind and the major third maybe is so open but then there's other times where the minor third is very condensed yeah. and that's right. where the emotion is exactly he right. has always said okay those are the easy instruments yeah. tell me about the boo good heavens it's so, you've got all those rows of tubes and that is chromatic going up and down how did you did you put that in your workroom too? Well, I went up to Los Angeles Percussion Rentals, mm -hmm. and that's where our instruments live in the off season, right? And where we record at the piece. Exactly. And so uh, I called Dan Savelle and I said, can I schedule a day to come up and spend some time with the boo? So by the time I'd finished my work with bass marimba and diamond marimba, I had a very good idea of the sections of the piece. In other words, I had my material that I wanted to work with. I knew here's the diamond marimba lead parts, Here's the parts that then the bass marimba will lead on, and then supporting material on both instruments that you can sort of change in and out and get some structural variation, right? Um, so I had an idea of the different sections that I wanted to write. Then going up and spending that day at Los Angeles Percussion Rentals, take all my notes and all my sketches, and then the first step is, okay, find my reference point. Where is G? Where are these standard arpeggios that I know, right? Where are the to play a G major arpeggio across the boo is a bunch of skips, but you can <laughs> find it. But then what was so wonderful is to find these sort of uh, secondary arpeggios, secondary chords and structures within that that had similar geometric shapes on the instrument, right? But tonally, they're but tonally totally different. different yeah. right? So now you, I, I, I treated that as an alfresco painting at that point. I had an outline between bass marimba and diamond, and the boo just became very, very uh, pastoral, coloristic stuff. And so what you'll hear 
throughout the boo quite a bit are are the very tight chromatic alterations yes. and just you know the the lines that weave up and down diving in and around uh, the diamond marimba and bass marimba stuff in that those are very tight chromatic intervals that Parcha scale offers us interesting yeah. and each instrument has its own little themes too so Correct. they come back and they they all work together were you ever able to hear the entire piece in, in your head at the same time, or was it in my head? Yes. Yeah, but, but when was the first time you actually heard it during the recording during session? During the recording session. Actually, it was probably after the recording session. <laughs> you know, Amazing. As things were put together, remember um, the sessions. The way we structured the sessions, uh, we did bass and diamond on the same day. Yeah. So I came in and did my part. Uh, Aaron came in several hours later to focus on her part, but Nick performed the boo at his studio independently of us. We, we have to remind folks that this is in the, the, the dead of night of COVID time, Indeed. and we could not be in the same room at the same time. Correct. We had to do it this way. Correct. So it was only where we got all the parts together, I sewed them together, and then you heard it. Actually, I remember the smile on your face. Yep. <laughs> I think and my first words to you were, hey, it really worked. It really works, <laughs> you know. And I was confident that it would. But there's just that point of satisfaction where you hear the same assimilation in the headphones that you heard in your mind. And, and that's, you know, great reinforcement that the background I have with bass marimba, the background that I have as a band, and mm -hmm. listening to the three of us play. This is my favorite trio in the band. I've said that often yes. over the past couple of years, is making music with Aaron and Nick is just a delight. And drawing that inspiration from Parch's repertoire, because he wrote so well for this mallet trio, mm -hmm. I wanted something to contribute close to that. So to hear it come together after your work as engineer, putting these things together, get the instruments balanced, um, it just came out as seamlessly as I had imagined it in my head, and that's a great day. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Let's hear it. Thank you. 